Hello, my name is Eric Ford, and I'd like to provide you with a brief overview of how I perceive st strategy and strategic management and their importance for people learning to become managers and administrators. And I've got a not unique perspective, but I draw on many different schools, as does everyone who teaches this sort of course. And if you're going to endure my lectures, sometimes it's good to have an understanding of where I'm coming from. And I hope that this gives you a brief overview of what I think about strategic management and its history. First, let's start with some terms. Strategy, the unifying theme that gives coherence and direction to the decisions of an organization. Okay, this is sort of the vision statement that you often hear about, or the mission statement, and we can talk about the difference between those two. But that's often embodied in strategy. Uh, strategic management consists of analyzing decisions and actions and putting in control mechanisms to ensure that we're achieving those strategic aims. And again, you also hear a lot about the strategic management process. And this has morphed over the past several decades from was what was originally referred to as long-range planning, became business policy, business policy became business policy and strategy, and eventually it just became referred to as strategic management. Uh, I should say that all of those terms have different nuances and differences that are worth understanding. In particular, things like long-range planning was talking about 15-year planning cycles and largely in the industrial sector. So it's worth knowing. All right? And you need to understand the process itself. There's a great deal of debate about whether the process has any value in our hyper-competitive rapid change environment. And these are questions we'll explore throughout the course. So what is strategic management? Well, basically it answers how and why do some firms outperform or are more sustainable or have a better competitive advantage than others. Okay, a few other definitions of strategy are worth taking note of. And I've got a picture here of a man named Chester Barnard, who was a uh, very successful executive in its own right and wrote one of the most influential books in strategy manage, strategic management history called The Functions of the Executive. I've actually got a picture of the book cover here. Uh, he also had a student named Herb Simon, Mr. Simon, Dr. Simon, later went on to win the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on decision making. And he referred to this as being the most influential book in management history, uh, which is saying something because Herb Simon uh, might lay claim to that himself uh, in a book that he wrote, uh, Administrative Behavior. So this is a book worth reading if you have the chance. Uh, it's written in an antiquated style, to say the least, where the word cooperation, for example, has umlauts over the first O. So it's worth looking into, though. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary, you'll notice, uh, refers to the art of war, and I'll go into that a little bit more later. And strategy definitely has a great deal of its history grounded in uh, military history. Uh, and as I mentioned, Dr. Barnard, strategy is intended to focus on the interdependence of the adversary's decisions and their decisions on expectations about each other's behavior. Uh, you'll notice in this quote, there's certain elements of what we would call game theory in modern, modern parlance. And while game theory may have been known to uh, Mr. Barnard, I don't think it was as well researched and integrated into the strategic management as it is today. But we'll talk about that during the course at some points. Uh, perhaps the father of modern strategy, or strategic management as we know it, is a man named Alfred Chandler. Dr. Chandler taught at Harvard and is famous for the book that you see uh, pictured here, The Visible Hand. This is juxtaposed against Adam Smith, uh, the father of economics, uh, famous uh, quote about the invisible hand of markets to direct industries. So this juxtaposes the role of the market against the role of management to try and shape the market and how organizations deliver these services. And he talks about the determination of the long-run goals and objectives of an enterprise. Again, you have to recall that this was coming out in the late 50s and early 60s when they were transitioning from long-range planning in what were perceived to be fairly stable environments where uh, production runs of automobiles and other products could last multiple years. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, Kenneth Andrews was a contemporary of 
uh, Dr. Chandler's, and he talked about strategy as the pattern of objectives, purposes, and goals, and the major policies for addressing these. And here we're starting to see more of an explicit link between strategies and policy. Again, I told you business policy was the name of the course prior to calling it strategic management. Okay, let's go back a little for, further in the origins of strategy. Uh, one book you'll often hear about is something called The Art of War, which was uh, written by a man named Sun Tzu in 360 BC in China. And he was integral to the domination of the Qin Dynasty over its contemporaries in what is now mainland China. And the reason we call it China is because of that dynasty's overthrow. And you see this has influenced many people's thoughts. Uh, here you see a picture of Paris Hilton reading Sun Tzu. I only can imagine what she must take away from these sorts of treaties. Uh, business strategy is relatively young. However, military strategy, as we, you can see, goes back thousands of years. Uh, the Greeks originated the term, and I think some of the other lectures that you'll see will go into strategos and how it means army uh, and lead. Modern strategy gets its origins in a man named Clausewitz, uh, Karl von Clausewitz. He was a Prussian general, and he wrote about the objectives of war and was one of the first to fully codify uh, how those objectives and strategy and tactics, tactics are a subset of strategy, how those two uh, interacted to the greatest effect. I do want to juxtapose this for just a moment against competition. So we talk about competition and strategy. I think many people feel that the goal of business strategy is to kill one's uh, opponents in the marketplace. And that simply isn't true. Uh, competition means to strive together. And this actually comes from the term Latin terms, which means to seek the prize. In other words, the best organizations are typically in competitive environments rather than monopolistic environments. Uh, by the way, it's a Greek urn, and I realize I'm talking about Latin. I look forward to your letters. Uh, but don't be distracted. If you've ever run a race, by the way, most people run much faster when they're running with other people. So that's why competition matters. And why, as a society and managers, we shouldn't seek monopolies per se. Rather, we should seek to build constructive competitive environments. And whether that takes on the form of a duopoly, meaning two firms, or a smaller firm, a set of firms, that's all up for debate and is largely the purview of economics, by the way. So what are some of the more recent historical developments moving away from war and Greek and Latin terms? Well, in 1946, a man named Alfred Sloan uh, took over as the CEO of General Motors, and he was the one who introduced the idea of an uh, automobile for every purse, I believe is what he referred to, meaning that however much you earned, there ought to be a car that you can buy at that price point. And it really uh, changed the way that the automobile market functioned when he did that. Uh, Ford had produced essentially one car, and you can have it any color you want as long as it's black sort of mentality. And while Ford had a great market share at the time, GM eventually overtook them under Mr. Sloan's uh, leadership. Uh, the school at MIT, the business school, is called the Sloan School of Management, by the way. Uh, another reference here to Chester Barnard. He argued managers should pay attention to strategic factors, and he was head of New Jersey Bell, which went on to be uh, AT&T as we know it today. More recent history, World War I and II, we really see strategy t playing a major role, and in large part, not because of the war itself, but because of the role of industry in winning those wars. You see a picture of a man here named McNamara. He was the Secretary of Defense under uh, Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and I believe even Nixon for a period. But he was part of the whiz kids, and during World War II, he served in the military in what would later become the Air Force, and they figured out many clever things. Like after we won the war in Europe, it was cheaper to build airplanes. You see a picture of a P-51 Mustang here. Uh, to build airplanes in Los Angeles and ship them to the Asian theater rather than to ferry them from Europe to America to Asia. So it was this sort of counterintuitive logic 
and numbers crunching and operation management. This is why we bombed dams to deny the enemy the use of power sources, why ball bearing plants became strategic targets. And a lot of this was built on resource allocations and scarce resource. In addition, we had learning curves, forecasting, and we could actually forecast when the war would end it and how many lives it would cost, etc. One of my favorite quotes comes from Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was the uh, Supreme Allied Commander in the European Theater and later went on to be President of the United States. Uh, he said, the things that are urgent are seldom important, and the things that are important are seldom urgent. The picture you see here is of General Eisenhower on the morning of D-Day. The, the men he is talking to are members of the 1st Airborne. Their forecasted casualty rate, meaning how many of them would die or be injured, was running between 70 and 90 percent. Apologize for that. Uh, and the fact that he went and talked to these men on the morning of D-Day rather than some of the other units is telling about his personal character and how he valued the most valuable resource of any uh, nation, its people, and in this case its soldiers. Uh, I won't uh, go into a whole lot more because we'll get into this in class, but we can talk about uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, uh, concepts such as marketing myopia. We'll frame the debate between Igor Ansoff and a man named Henry Mintzberg, which was fairly big in the 1970s and even into the early 80s, talking about corporate strategies, deliberate, emergent, and realized, etc. We'll spend a great deal of time in the class talking about a man named Michael Porter, etc. So here are some of the uh, evolutions of strategic management. As I said, uh, we talked about the 50s, blank, planning and control, long-range planning, etc. 60s, corporate planning, growth strategies, forecasting becomes more important. Terms like synergy start to enter the picture. In the 70s, we're starting to see the idea of positioning within the market to take advantage of different sectors. Uh, people are performing more sophisticated industry analyses. Uh, we'll talk about the BCG, the Boston Consulting Group Matrix, etc. Uh, late 80s and 90s, competitive advantage and sustainable competitive advantage become concepts. And we can even link these to the idea of sustainability in terms of green and environmentalism later as we get into the 2000s, the period of your life that we'll start to cover. And we'll talk about resource capabilities, shareholders and stakeholders, uh, the complexity of the environment, and how to partner. Well, thank you. That's a brief overview, and I hope you find this useful as we go forward.